syllabus is a little bit different because the emphasis is going to be different this semester. Uh, there's a great quotation from Leonardo in the first paragraph. Read that sometime. Very famous. It's a commentary on, on those who know a little about anatomy, uh, those that were his contemporaries, and they made the most of the little that they knew. And as a consequence, their figures looked like bundles of radishes, sacks of nuts. You should read that. It's a great quotation. Uh, Second page, the emphasis will be on the harness of musculature upon the skeleton. Now that presumes that you have a working familiarity with the joint system. Let me demonstrate. And by the way, I thought everybody did pretty well on those tests. It's <laughs> very gratifying. Now if you have questions in your own mind about joint systems, work on it see me or otherwise get that information because when we put on the muscles it's not going to mean anything if you don't understand what the joint systems are all about. So if you're not clear about it, come on up here, check it out, see how they move or ask me. We can have a conference. There's some people who are just joining us this semester anyhow. So we're going to have to have some sort of a makeup day sometime, someplace. Don't you see that the skeleton on the inside and the muscles on the outside, that the, muscle, the job of the muscles will be to act as a harness. Think of a harness, wraps, straps wrapping around and tying on and pulling and so on. It's a good analogy. And uh, one of the first concepts we dealt with in musculature was the fact that they had to have an origin, a starting place, and an insertion, a place where they tied in. They had to cross a joint, at least one joint, and that they pulled. This should sound familiar to you. So indeed, it is a harness. And you could think of it something like this. The only this is useful for me, but see the muscular portion of the, of the construction of, of the harness is made up of fibers that can contract and pull. However, there are pieces of the contractile portion of a muscle called tendons that are non-elastic. So this is Strictly speaking, not a great analogy for a muscle, but it's easy for me, in the case of, let's say, the biceps, for me to hold it on a point of origin and run it to a point of insertion and show that it pulls and how it pulls. So I will be using this probably every time <coughs> it's a strap, it's elastic, but in terms of a muscle, Strictly speaking, there is one elastic sort of part of it, the contractile part. But the points of origin, little whitish, bluish fibers, tendons, are non-elastic. Nothing would happen if those were, if the whole business were just elastic. So the tendinous parts are non-elastic. And I'll demonstrate that. I'll draw that up here. So then in the case of biceps, we have an origin. We have an insertion, very specific points, where it starts, where it goes. And in terms of the joint systems, why would you have a muscle that doesn't cross a joint system? It wouldn't make sense. Why would you have a muscle starting here and going to here? What would it do? What's its function? It wouldn't do anything. So keep that in mind that as we envelop the figure in all the familiar forms, that it's comprised of a number of separate bundles, separate strands that have a starting point, cross a joint, tie in somewhere, something happens. Keep that in mind, it gets complex. You have to retrench and regroup and go back to what you're familiar with. In other words, 
think of a muscle as a, having a starting point, as I said, uh, an anchor point, and a point where it ties in and insertion, crossing a joint, and then pulling. Keep that in mind. Because there are 19 attachments that involve the scapula. It's quite complex because you move this around. All sorts of things are happening. And uh, it gets confusing, but as a last resort, you can at least think back to the idea, the concept that it has these basic elements. So now joint systems. Just to review, because you can't start on musculature without reviewing the joint system. Joints are where bones come together. It's called articulation. And there are fixed places where bones come together. You don't think of it as a joint, really. You think of a joint as something movable. But in the classi classification of joints, the first classification is of those bones that come together but are locked. And that takes place in the cranium. So that's without movement. And then there are the gliding movements in terms of the movement of the ribs upon the uh, vertebrae. There are gliding movements that take place in the wrist, in the foot, small bones of the foot. Um, then there are the, so that's slightly movable. And then there are the freely movable joints of ball and socket, hinge, and rotating joints. So as we talk about any part of the figure, we're going to be talking about joint systems and then what puts that into action. That's the way to think about musculature. Uh, as it's defined in the Rubens book, it's a plan of action at the joint systems. Think of it that way. So, again, to review, you have humerus, So here's our upper arm, forearm. This happens to be in the flexed position. Well, something has to be pulling on that radius to put the arm in that position. So the concept is to take a series of parallel, in this case, parallel fibers that are contractile, indicated here in red, muscle bundle. And at this point, it attaches to a tendon, which comes from the word to extend to, which is non elastic <coughs> And at the other end, then you have a tendinous portion, which is also, obviously, non-elastic, which extends to. Where did they extend to? In this case, the bicep would extend to an origin at the top, up and through here, and extend to an insertion. So when it pulls, <clears throat> this will contract and compress. And these won't change because they're non-elastic. So something else has to give. What has to give is the movement at the joint. So if it were just elastic, I mean, it could contract and release and contract and release, and nothing would happen with the bone. So <coughs> this would be the tendinous part. This would be the body of it. And this is tendon again. And these books, they indicate these anchor points with O and I, oftentimes, origin, insertion. 
I sometimes refer to this as an anchor point. It seems like you know something solid. The origin is generally considered to be the fixed portion in this system. When you pull something, in order to have it respond, you have to have a fixed portion, and then you have a movable part. This is all review. We've talked about this before. This is considered to be at the insertion the movable part. So think of it in terms of flexing an arm. Let me hitch on uh, one bundle of biceps here and see how you feel about it. Side. And one on the ulna side. 
side, and you can see my middle layer one, which goes to the digits. This is the muscle that's the middle layer one that goes two thirds of the way out onto the finger. And then finally here, you have a palmaris longus. It just goes to the fascia of the hand, doesn't tie onto a bone, just ties to the fascia of your hand and acts as a flexor of the hand. So it gets complex, and there's even more stuff on the forearm on this side, on this flexor side. Back to the strap. Good. At this point, is it mostly penetrating here? You'll see that the contour, even on my emaciated arm here, the contour here is round, and you can kind of get a sense of where the body of the muscle is becoming tenderness. And it happens that way on the left. Same way. Generally, the plan is to keep the body of the muscle away from the joints so that they don't impede the movement of the joints. It would be a traffic problem. So instead, it's very tenderness as it crosses the joint. It's more efficient. It doesn't get in the way. So generally, in joint systems, you will see the bones more in evidence. Somewhat here, somewhat here, quite a bit here. Um, okay, so let's pull this out. And just at random, let me give you a few. So again, this is not a perfect, uh, it's not perfectly synonymous with muscle, but it'll give us points of origin and points of insertion. All right, this fellow up here has his hand palm back. You want to turn this supinated so it's palm forward. I've got a muscle. I want to put it on here someplace. The thing to do is to consider the joint system. What is it that moves the palm forward? The movement at this point moves the palm forward. Lucky for you, your hand is attached to the radius. The radius can move. So now muscle can only pull. So let me give you the answer. If I use the elbow bone, which in this movement is not going to move, in other words, in this rotation, the elbow bone is not moving. I have my thumb on it. And that became an origin for a very short muscle, right where my thumb is holding it down. And I reach this strap across the radius and tied it onto the radius like that as an insertion. And pull on that, it's going to pull the radius, swivel the radius, rotate the radius, and the result is the palm swivels forward. That action is called supination. Haven't I told you how I remember that? <coughs> that this is supinating, this is pronating? Ask for soup. Ask for a donation, supinate. Honestly, I use that every time I can stop and think. All right, so now this fellow has his hand palm forward. How do you do this? How do you do the opposite thing? Well, you look at the same joint system. You're going to be pulling this back around, something probably on the opposite side. Origin. On this medial epicondyle of the humerus, has to cross over and reach onto the radius, or it's not going to move the radius. As an insertion, insertion is the point where it's going to move. So as the muscle pulls, the palm goes back. Let's take something that you can see a little bit better. Movement of the head. Origin, insertion. When it pulls, head rotates the other way. You're pulling back of the head forward when you pull on it. Um, 
movement of the arm backwards. This way. The muscle's going to pull. So obviously you have to attach to the arm. Okay, so let's attach here. Would it work if I attach to pull this back? If I attach uh, this muscle to here? Probably. As it happens, you don't need to go that far. All you need to do is anchor it to here, but is there indeed a muscle that's like that in the figure? Can you see what I'm doing? No. It's up here. Does the same thing. Put this in the dorsi. So, let me hitch it on. Way up high, let me show you. Right there. is the insertion. And we want to pull this back. So obviously this muscle isn't going to be straight. You angle it back. And in fact, latissimus comes from the word for wide, widest, and it has multiple points of origin. But this would work. And this pulls and pull this back. As it happens, this muscle also wraps around this way as a consequence has a direct effect on the movement of the arm. You want to raise your arm to the side, up and to the side. This would do it. If there's anything out here. So, origin, that's fixed. Insertion about two fists the way down. When this pulls, arm responds. Deltoid. <coughs> you want to pull your arm up and around and back. It's movement basically at this joint. Basically the humerus, origin, insertion. It's another portion of the deltoid. When this pulls, arm responds. Now these scapulae are wired on here, which has to be in this model, but uh, I mean, it, it really isn't. If you get used to the fact that the scapula is so immobile, it's a misconception. It's moving all the time, sliding on the ribcage. When I do this, the neck is involved. Origin, that's fixed. Insertion to the scapula. When it pulls in the direction of the neck, it raises the scapula. Like an elevator. Raises it. Levator scapula. The raising muscle of the scapula. And so on. Um, so let's do some of this um, in uh, these diagrams. In fact, we can use these. There's a lot going on. Muscle systems are very busy. Shoulder is raised, the other shoulder is depressed, the spine is somewhat rotated, the torso is laterally flexed, one knee is raised, the other leg is locked, this arm is abducted, this arm is abducted, it means movement away, this hand is flexed, this hand is held rigidly in a position which means a combination of flexion and extension, just so and head is turned. So we get a lot to talk about. But let me just pick a couple of things. The idea of this, I've got a four drawings that, that hopefully will illustrate some of this, is that by knowing Slinaro's idea, you just don't put bumps everywhere. 
you would want to emphasize, especially drawing from memory, as this is, this is a memory drawing, emphasize those muscles that are functioning particular to this pose, and perhaps de-emphasize or subordinate the other muscles. You don't just draw them all in as bumps, just as like an inventory, like a shopping list. So, laterally flexed. This oblique is pulling sweaty somewhat. It also has to do with the muscles of the spine. Head is turned. You can see here's jaw, chin, face. If I turn my head this way, I pull by this sternomastoid muscle, I pull the back of the head forward. If I raise this shoulder, trapezius, the muscles have direction in direct proportion to their function. It's one to one. This hand is flexed relative to the forearm. Well, muscles pull. If you look at a forearm, and you want to flex this hand, you need to look for an origin on the bone, an anchor point, to which you can hitch a muscle bundle and run into the hand. Well, there's a big one sticking out right here. It's that, it's that part of the end, that T-shape, the distal end of the humerus that you use when you have one too many extra packages and you just put one underneath your arm and, you, and you've got this bump sticking out here that helps you hold that in there. That's under here. That's the origin for many of these flexor muscles that go to this hand. This hand is flexed, so I emphasize this. This arm is abducted, so delta is involved. This arm is swung out to the side slightly. So deltoid is involved. This arm is not flexed, so biceps, I don't know why I emphasize that. It's not flexed. That could be a little, a little uh, less strong. Leg is raised. How do you do that? You have to do that every time you take a step. Raise your leg. This would do it. There's nothing out here. As it happens, there is a system that involves the pelvis for raising the leg. Straight, 
And that's all I'm going to talk about on this diagram. We mentioned it before. It's an amazing system. When you rotate your arm, you raise your arm. It's not just a deltoid. Deltoid is just here. Deltoid is an abductor, basically an abductor. When you raise your arm like this, at a certain point, the whole scapula moves with it. So now the normal position for a scapula is something like this. Where this vertebral border is so named because it's parallel to the vertebrae, is pretty much parallel to that. Here it's begun sort of a rotation. Three things happen to rotate it. Let me draw some simple diagrams. Position one, position two, position three. rotate that, you could do three things. You could pull down on this portion. You could pull up on this portion. And you could pull forward in this portion. If you wanted to swivel something, you tied, you had this huge slab you wanted to rotate. You tied a rope here and here and here and had everybody pulling, somebody pulling this way, somebody pulling this way, somebody pulling this way, would facilitate the rotation. This is serratus anterior, this is trapezius, and this is trapezius. We have to talk about the scapula in some detail because there's 19 muscles. But this is a major one. That's why this area is so complex. Go to another one. These are all memory drawings and uh, <coughs> actually done for another purpose, but we're using them here anyhow. Okay. Um, arm is flexed, head is turned. I'm glad I drew that in there. That's that. Sternal map's good. This leg is flexed. When this leg flexes, it drops. If I keep this leg stiff and straight and flex this, it drops on that side. If I just did that without adjusting my weight, this is aside from this discussion, but it's important. If I just stood this way, flex this leg, and start to tip this way. So what you do is to compensate, get all this weight up over here, over this one supporting foot. The consequence of that is called contrapposto, positioning against. And when you do that, there are all sorts of muscles that pull, others let go, others pull. It's a very complex system. When you're drawing from memory, I'm always sort of conscious of where does this all go, actually, in this leg, does this leg take the weight the way it should, is it in a proper position, and so on. Well, let's talk about a couple of the muscle bundles. Duramastoid, arm is flexed, biceps. Torso is flexed. Deep 
one. It lies underneath all these three. You don't see it. Number four is in there. When you stand on one leg so that your hip doesn't just throw all the way out and have to pull on the trochanter so that you stabilize that joint. I'll show you on the skeleton. Gluteus medius. scholar in the room here. Forgot what the accents are. <clears throat> it means flayed, as you know. It means stripping away basically the layers of skin to reveal the construction and design and plan of the muscular arm. So when you get into the study of all this, you hopefully will be able to 
go through a leg fairly well and produce an écorché. It will inform your work. And then you can choose which muscles will be in use, what their shapes are, hopefully what some of their origins and insertion are. So let me play this leg. It's big enough, I think, to be seen. Let me insert a commercial for this course and the other anatomy course. As far as I'm concerned, think of a leg as just a contour that rides on the surface. It's not what it's all about. It's like those hand shadows that are just shapes. It has no function. It has no feeling of, of uh, weight, density, and the differences between its parts, bony, muscular, tenderness, straps, the harness. Okay. Here's the uh, gluteus maximus, the drives to an insertion. There's trochanter. This is gluteus medius. Gluteus maximus ties the sacrum to posterior iliac spine, overlaps part of the gluteus medius, and ties to the bone. Uh, running along the bone is the vastus lateralis muscle. Running on top of that some, sometimes flattens the appearance of the side of the leg. This is a strap running from here called the iliotibial band. So look at the combination of stuff we've got now. We've got a very unique shape, full, large, powerful, short. And on the front, in this view, you have long, lean, most of it is just tendon, very wide tendon, and a very short muscular portion of it. The plan is very varied. So this is vastus lateralis with some side. And in this view, I should show this connecting to the patella and by a short strap to the lower leg. Now, what's this stuff? And this is part of this leg. Those are where the flexors are. When you bend your lower leg, there are straps running down the back of your upper leg, tying to the lower leg, pulling. Five steps of leg. Long head. Short head, I can't show you, it's deep. Emerging from underneath, gluteus maximus. Going from here. Origin. And it has a counterpart on the other side. Some tendinosis. In this view, they split apart, and the calf muscle, the gastrocnemius, fits right in. So the egg crochet here is complete on the upper leg. And I'll give you two muscles of the lower leg in this, and then that'll be it. Gastrocnemius, you know. right on the top, it has two bellies, hence its name, gastro. The outer belly is higher and the lower one is lower. And the insertion is to the heel. So when it pulls, it pulls your heel up, you go up on your tiptoes. When you walk, that happens. And it is assisted in part by the muscle that's directly under it, which would only Slightly in this view, 